Okay, greetings everyone. I'm Carrie Masley and I'd like to welcome you to our second ever Society of Mississippi Archivists virtual table talk. This is our first season of table talks and they will feature archivists and historians across Mississippi who have incorporated social justice themes into their workspaces, projects and research. Before we start, I want to do a little housekeeping. We will have a brief uh, Q&A session immediately following the presentation. I will be monitoring questions in the chat throughout the talk, so please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, so that they're not overlooked. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this presentation over to our presenters. Please welcome our speakers, Ms. Angela Stewart and Dr. Harrison, who will be giving their talk, Community Collaboration, the Margaret Walker Center and Scott Ford House, Inc. Thank you, Carrie. I want to thank you as well as the Society of Mississippi Archivists for this opportunity to um, talk about both the Margaret Walker Center and the Scott Ford Incorporated initiative that Dr. Harrison is spearheading. Um, and thank you for allowing me to share because I do have a PowerPoint I want to share. Yeah, thank you both for being here. Okay, I think it's coming here. Yes. Yes, um, the Margaret Walker Center and the Scott Ford Incorporated have a long and rich history that extends back to our founder, Margaret Walker. And I want to talk a little bit about the center. This is um, at the unveiling of the Margaret Walker marker for the Mississippi Writers Trail. The Margaret Walker Center is, we are an archive and a museum dedicated to the preservation, interpretation, and dissemination of African American history and culture. We were founded in 1968 by Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander as the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People. And we seek to honor her academic and artistic legacy through our archival collections, exhibits, and public programs. I want to acknowledge our staff, starting with our current director, Dr. Robert Luckett. Our oral historian, Ms. Elisa Ray Funderburk. I want to give a special thanks to Lance Wheeler, who's our education and public relations manager, who's been helping push this event for us. And also Mrs. Trina Tolles, who is our building and funds manager. She is the literally the wind beneath our wings, making sure that we get our programming done. Um, as I said, we were founded in 1968 by Margaret Walker. I've also called her Margaret Walker Alexander. But we've added, in addition to our work as an archive and a museum at Air Hall, which is on the campus of Jackson State University, we also sponsor tours of the COFO Civil Rights Education Center, which here again, Dr. Harrison was um, instrumental in helping to received funds for the restoration of the COFO Center. It served as the headquarters for the Council of Federated Organizations, especially during the Freedom Summer of 1964. And it is now a education center dedicated to challenging and cultivating young minds in the history of the civil rights movement, as well as where do we go from here in the future. Currently, both the Margaret Walker Center and the COFO Center are closed to outside visitors due to our COVID restrictions. Um, so keep in touch with us and we can let you know when we will be back online in terms of tours and researchers. And I just wanted to share um, Part of what we do is public programming and one event we host every year is something that we now call the um, Creative Arts and Scholarly Engagement Festival. And this was last year's festival um, featuring noted documentary photographer Roy Lewis, who's capturing an image of author Kevin Powell, who was speaking to a group of students in Air Hall that's actually in 
our conference room. Last year, 2019, you know, with everything that's been going on this year, 2019 seems like such a long time ago, but we were actually on program at the Society of Mississippi Archivists meeting at Mississippi State. Um, and this is with Amara Johnson, who was a student worker from Millsaps, April Blevins, me, and of course, our center director, Dr. Luckett. And then this is our founding director, Margaret Walker. She was born in Birmingham, Alabama, July 7th, 1915. Spent the bulk of her childhood in New Orleans, Louisiana, where she attended high school. After graduating high school, she attended Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where she received her bachelor's degree in English. She worked for a time in Chicago with the Federal Writers Project, and after that, returned to graduate school and received her master's in English um, at the Writers Workshop at the State University of Iowa. And her master's thesis was actually the publication of her first book of poetry by Yale University Press, For My People. We are so honored and excited this year. Margaret Walker was a 2020 inductee into the Max Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Hall of Fame. And so just this month, as a matter of fact, we celebrate her induction into that Hall of Fame. Scott Ford, Mar um, Dr. Harrison is gonna talk more about the history of Scott Ford, but the Dr. Harrison, in addition to being the um, driving force behind Scott Ford, was also the second director of the Margaret Walker Center. And as such, we have been involved with the Fair Street District and the Scott Ford Houses since actually going back to Margaret Walker's tenure at the Margaret Walker, was now the Margaret Walker Center. The Scott Ford Houses are located on East Cohee Street, which is a part of what is known as the Ferris Street Historic District in Jackson, um, area of Jackson known as Midtown. Um, these houses were owned by the Mary Green Scott and Virginia Scott Ford. They were midwives and business people living and working in the Fair Street Historic District. The collaboration that includes the Margaret Walker Center is a community collaboration. And this is one of the events, the festivals that have been held at the actual sites of the houses, including the woman speaking is Dr. Frida Bush, who started out as a, her career as a nurse midwife and is now a retired obstetrician gynecologist in the Jackson area. And other community members, including State Representative Alice Clark, who came out in support of the Scott Ford program. Here, one of the collaborations we have had at the Margaret Walker Center with Scott Ford is the oral history program. And this is one of the oral history collecting events or sharing our stories that was held at the Smith Robertson Museum. And you can see um, in the center there is Mrs. Minta Yusadima, who served as director of the nurse midwifery program at the University of Mississippi Medical Center um, here in Jackson. And we gathered oral histories from people who had been delivered by midwives, people who were related to midwives, and just who had a history with the field of midwifery in the Scott Ford area, including some family members of the Scott Fords as well. Tonight, um, this evening from six to eight, we will be hosting our third regional forum on midwives in Mississippi. And we're looking at regional perspective of Mississippi midwives from um, Jim Crow to civil rights. This year we are focused, this evening we're focusing on the Tupelo area. And while these forums are staged at Smith Robertson Museum, 
they are hosted via Zoom, so they are virtual. And if you're interested, you can reach out to scottfordhouse.org uh, or email scott.ford.houses at gmail.com for more information about this evening's forum as well as the forum on October 23rd as well. Um, the Marvin Walker Center, I just wanted to share some ways that you can find out more about us. We have a website that's available, which is jsums.edu backslash Margaret Walker Center. We also have on our um, website, our digital archives project. You can also on our website, you can join our listserv and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, we are very excited about the Scott Ford program because it does look at a community of women who helped to bring literally life into this world, who were oftentimes marginalized and forced out by political and medical establishment. So being able to chronicle their stories is an important part of learning more about our communities. And that's one of the missions of the Margaret Walker Center. I am now going to turn, turn it over to Dr. Alfredine Harrison and let her talk to you about Scott Ford. Dr. Harrison. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> and the community uh, I appreciate the fact that was again with that puts my work in practice. Sometimes it gets so comfortable at the tower of our institution. For us. So too often it takes uh, like those of the 1960s that the university of Kent, civil rights struggle, are to a life of the Bible and But a revolutionary in what she wanted to do with her journals, correspondence, and lectures for her marginalized people that she wrote about in the poem for my people. So I want to make about 10 points here uh, of how I have tried to serve the African American marginalized community at the University of Kansas. First, now with the stop for my spirit and will to work with my marginalized community, the African American community, began in 1967 when I served as PhD instructor and assistant to the dean of the College of Liberal Arts in Black for Black Studies. Since there was very little, if any, information in the KU library, African American communities. I gave them assignments that involved conducting all history interviews with their family members who knew the origins of their communities. So at the end of the semester, their interviews were graded <clears throat> and donated to the University of Kansas Spencer Research Library. A very Today, that is documenting the African American communities in Kansas. Um, I found the same lack of archival resource, resources in marginalized communities, like at Southern University in Baton Rouge, at Jackson State University. You know, because when I was at Kansas, I said, well, the Black students got it all. <laughs> anyway, I was there when we didn't have it all together. So I decided to work on the problem by not only suggesting that my students in Black Studies classes conduct oral histories, 
of their community's origin, but I commanded that the curriculum committee add oral history and historic preservation as electives. Additionally, in 1972, as professor of history at Jackson State University, um, traditional oral history research, uh, I had been so involved with it that I just kept it up with the final And uh, the good thing about the collaboration with uh, Jackson State University is providing a place for the enemies uh, and the other resources that had been collected. Otherwise, it may have been lost or destroyed. So I am very grateful to the work that Margaret Walter Center continues to do. Uh, 1979 to 2008, as director of my study research center, I not only continued that on history project, but for 19 years, I collaborated with my mentor and retired JSU professor, Margaret Walker. Now, you may not understand, but she had, she was completely uh, devoted, I mean, the Lord of the University, she had service retired. So we collaborated with her at her request. And the JSU administrators actually did the same thing. And we brought in Robert Parker Adams to restore Air Hall with archival spaces, special vault spaces with proper temperature and control to store Walter's papers. Now, she was telling us what to do. Um, in our conversation, her reference was always the binding collection. Was a Spencer Research Center at the University of Kansas. So, in a sense, we made a good team because I, both of us, had had uh, good experiences at research libraries. Um, so, um, I was also collaborated for for marginalized communities after adapting Air Hall to the proper archival facility and signing over her papers to JSU, to the JSU Research Center, that is the Margaret Walker Center, she then transferred the boxes of her papers that we kept her put together. But she transferred, she kept them in her house, and then she transferred them to the vault so they were ready. The humidity controls at the uh, Air Hall. She told persons who had parts of her papers to do the same. Why did she do this? She wanted to be an inspiration to JSU students and her marginalized community. She often said that the Yale University Bionic and Rare Book Manuscript was her wish, but that could offer her what to Posterity and her marginalized She had taught and developed the first life studies institute. She wanted to be more in depth in her death. So she had organized and help. She had ordered that her body would lay a lie in repose, I think that's the right word, in the basement of Air Hall near the vault that contained her painting. This was done for her marginalized dead students and the community. Going on though, the fifth point is the collaboration with the plot for houses, which uh, Angela referred to had been developed before I retired from Jackson State. We were working with the therapy services on many things. But I was the vice president of the plot for uh, Inc. shortly after they were by Dorothy Dobbins. He was spot for the house in 1996. She specified in the donation, uh, uh, in, in the setting of, of the 501c3, that it was to be a museum in honor of, the, of her grandmother, Granny Midwife, the Jimmy Scott Ford. And I could say a lot about that, but going on in my retirement, then I have tried to continue that natural relationship between the Scott Ford and the Margaret Walker Center. More than that, Margaret Walker has also participated, that is the Margaret Walker Center, has participated and in research and reached out to the Sarah Student Story District shortly 
after who was nominated to the National Register of Historic Places in 1980. In 1986, Margaret Walker wrote, wrote a book, not just one poem, but a whole book of poems on Ferris Street. And if you've never read those, they, it's a real and poetic description of uh, Ferris Street. But she wrote, started this with the dedication of that multi colored sculpture called Ferris Street Quilt by Linda S. That was dedicated on February the 27th, 1986. Uh, recently, in continuing the collaboration with Ferris Street, the Margaret Walker Center has published an interpreted plaque that contains the poem Patchwork Quilt. Now, only has the Margaret Walker Center collaborated with the Scott Ford for nearly five years by giving Scott Ford letters of support for grants, of uh, publicity, but it has recently posted a five day seminar for our introductory examination of their current holdings on uh, midwives. Midwifery, we have stored our all of history interviews there. And uh, it was the best place that we could have had them because, like Angela does, she was there to help us out. But that's a wonderful collaboration that we have. Margaret Walker Center is a great collaborator because Scott Ford House doesn't have, nor does it plan to have adequate space to facilitate to accommodate this kind of deep interviewing and discussion of digital oral history. So uh, the goal is to develop a database of grand midwife stories that can be used uh, in a summary form at the Scott Ford uh, houses. But uh, there are specific information to be accessed at the Margaret Walker Center for research purposes. Uh, the houses are just not in charge of us. Wonderful to have this kind of uh, opportunity as you say. Now, so as we have finances available, we will purchase equipment to conduct additional oral histories, but our goal will never be to try to store them for public retrieval or research. That's where the site for collaborative relationship with Margaret Walker Center uh, is so valuable for us. Uh, now, another point is uh, Scott Ford has similar collaborative relationship with uh, the uh, Smith Robertson Museum and Culture Center. In addition to storage, there is dining room space there and museum size deep there. Our artifacts are stored with them until we need to use them. If we never decide to use them, Smith Robertson will have new artifacts for their use. The same way with and with the market wants to say, but I think that uh, <clears throat> these are collaborations. We could talk more about the collaboration between the Smith Robertson Museum and uh, the Margaret Walker Center. And finally, there are two collaborative initiatives. Smith is decided to the artists involved. The Mississippi Humanities Council virtual forum entitled Presenting Regional Perspectives of Granny Midwives uh, from Scott Ford. In fact, this evening, and Angela, thank you for the plug, I will go ahead. In fact, this evening, we are focusing on particular regions among the presenters are scholars like Angela Stewart and Lindsay Moore, particularly. If you heard, like she said, you can still get on the Zoom program by emailing your request to scott.org.com at gmail.com before 2.30 this afternoon. Sandra, our administrative assistant, will then email you the link. The forum is from 6 to 8 p.m. this evening. Among Scott's folks' goals is to find alcohol sources on Mississippi Grand and Midwives that might be in your archival collection. By you sharing your list of resources with the site, you will be starting a great collaborative statewide project 
for African American uh, resources uh, and the marginalized communities that still exist throughout the state of Mississippi. Also, at the same time, we would be creating a statewide database of Mississippi planning midwives that could be used at the start for planning midwife housing. Uh, Museum at 136 East Cohesive and Jackson, available for research at the JSC Wilder Walker Research Center, and searchable from anywhere, including your own institution. Further, to help restore the Mississippi landmark, Scott Point, Midwife Houses, if it appeals to you, send a signed pledge of X number of dollars on your letterhead to four thousand. P.O. Box 11 in Mississippi, 39215. Or call me at 601 by Monday, 10, 7, 28. This could be a way to connect to Mississippi Arsenal with resources on ground. Walker's poetry and Margaret Walker wrote a collection of poems on Ferris Street that are included in her collected works and just to plug for the Margaret Walker Center we do have her collected works which are called this is my century new and collected poems for sale at the Margaret Walker Center and I just wanted to share the poem that Dr. Harrison mentioned a patchwork quilt. This street is like my grandmother's patchwork quilt, kaleidoscope applique with multicolored threads of embroidery. A golden sun, blue skies carpeted with the greenness, the yellow, the red, the white, the black, the brown, the checkered, bright gingham, fine silk and satin and linen cloth, pattern patches on the faces of these people the Chinese laundryman, black cobbler, Greek grocer. Down the street, there used to be a livery stable with a brown Indian man. Now there's a taxi stand. One street cars passed along the side of Capitol to where black slaves built the Capitol, the mansion for the governor, and over there, the city hall. They made these bricks and laid them too, not knowing someday they would meet as black and tan in 1868. This patchwork quilt is stitched with blood and tears. The street is paved with martyred black men's flesh and bones. And that's Margaret Walker's poem, A Patchwork Quilt, that she wrote about Ferris Street. Um, we at the Margaret Walker Center are, as I, I said earlier, we are so grateful to the Society of Mississippi Archivists, and Carrie Masley in particular for this opportunity to talk about both Scott Ford and the Margaret Walker Center. As I mentioned, you can find out more information about the Margaret Walker Center. You can just Google Margaret Walker Center and our website is jsums.edu backslash Margaret Walker Center and find out more information about us. We do include a digital archives project on our website that archives almost 50% of Margaret Walker's personal papers, as Dr. Harrison mentioned. Margaret Walker was very intentional about leaving her papers to Jackson State University where she had worked for 30 years. So we do have 50% of her papers archived and digitized and available for research on our website. Carrie, um, we are ready for questions or? Okay, great. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can put them in the Q&A box and I'll kind of moderate that for you. Um, we do have a couple of questions that are popping up now. Um, let's see. Mona Vansley, she works um, for the Columbus Lounge Public Library. She says that um, 
This is all very good to know. I've had a, several patrons over the years come in researching midwives here in Columbus, but she has very little on that topic. So that's good for her to know. Um, I do have a follow up question related to that. How can um, people access that midwives database that Dr. Harrison was talking about? The database is actually still in process of being developed. So right now we're not ready to be open to the public yet, um, but they can email me, Angela.B.Stewart at JSUMS.edu. And I do have a certain number of the um, oral histories available via private YouTube link. Okay, great. Um, share, but right now it's not open to the public. Wonderful. It's still good to being know. processed. Great. Um, now we have another question. MJ Scott is wanting to know how researchers can listen to the oral histories. Is that kind of the same? Do, do they have to get in touch with you to access that? They can actually reach out to our oral historian, Elisa Ray Funderburk, or you can just simply email MWA at jsums.edu, and that's our email address. And just let us know what you would like to connect with. Currently, our oral histories are not available publicly online in terms of being able to listen to them. We do have a certain number of them digitized and ready for um, posting, but right now, that's something you would have to email us and we have to work out. Okay, great. So you said Alyssa Funderburk would be the person? Okay. A-L-I-S-S-A Ray, R-A-E, Funderburk. F-U-N-D-E-R-B-U-R-K. But like I said, this, this email, Marla Walker, our center address, which is mwa at jsums.edu. Great. Great. And I want to mention Mona Vance Ali. We've we have had a wonderful relationship with her in the Columbus Lounge Library. We produced an exhibit um, based on one of our um, collections that she hosted at the Columbus Lounge Library. So we're grateful to Mona Vance Ali and her support of the Marlowe Walker Center. All right. Are there any other questions? Oh, Mona says yes. She loves you guys too. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I'm just kind of curious what your um, workflow looks like. I know that it, it, it sounds like it's a pretty big project. Um, so, and you, you have two separate entities that are collaborating on this. So, what does that workflow look like? Yeah. Currently, what we're doing right now is we're collecting data. So we are having the virtual forums, such as what's happening tonight, um, that's gonna be actually focused on the area where you and Mona are, the Golden Triangle area, Tupelo, Columbus, right. Stockton, that area. Um, so that's part of our collecting the information. Um, once we have collected the information, it's a process of digitizing it and um, organizing it so that it can be prepared for um, a database as well as for public use. Okay. Right now we, are, we are in a collecting mode. We are collecting, okay. we're collecting stories. We've had um, public in-person forum. Before COVID, we had public in-person forums at the Smith Robertson Museum where individuals came in and we had people who brought in birth certificates that showed they had been delivered by granny midwives. We had people whose mothers or grandmothers or great grandmothers had been granny midwives and they shared the stories of their lives. Um, so we had experts to come in and talk about the transition from granny midwives to professional medical care such as obstetricians to now we're going back to midwives and doulas, um, especially during this COVID time where people are looking more to maybe having at home childbirth um, as well as um, 
just wanting a more personalized care system. Right. Um, Mona Vance Ali has another question. She says, do the midwife materials focus on anyone that was a midwife in Mississippi or specifically African Americans? Right now, African American Mississippi midwives. Um, we have, like I said, we've had people who've come in telling the stories of mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers, community members who served as midwives. Um, and it's been interesting because we've been looking at midwives from basically from around, well, 16, 19, but really 18, 17 to 19. 40 ish is the basic area where we're looking at the during slavery and during um, the Jim Crow era. And the, as I said, the transition from lay midwives, women who weren't um, trained professionally, but maybe apprenticed another midwife to medical doctors who largely took over the delivery of babies. Okay, and we have someone who asked in the chat, um, let me get to the chat real quick. Um, can you explain why midwifery stopped? Well, it was a deliberate um, plan on the part of the federal government and state governments in terms of public health. It, after the Civil War, obstetrics, the scientific medical care of women during pregnancy and childbirth became more focused and driven and looked to drive out women who, like I said, they hadn't been professionally trained to deliver babies. And they often used the excuse of high infant mortality and um, the mortality rates among mothers as an excuse to step in and take control over the childbirth process. But there were things like the Shepherd Towner Act, which was passed in 1921. Um, Mississippi hired um, women such as Laura Reed and Mary Osborne to come in and supervise midwives. And that supervision turned into a gradual really pushing out of lay, and when, uh, when I say lay midwives, these are people who weren't trained because you also have that came about in Mississippi, probably in the 1970s, nurse midwives, women who had had initial nurse training and then went on for specialized training in midwifery to come into the state as well. But there, but it was a way to wrest control of the medical care of women and babies from lay individuals. Very interesting. Okay, does anyone have any further questions? It looks like we're all caught up on them. And also, I just wanted to mention that um, at the Margaret Walker Center, we here again check our um, calendar of events. We have a number of virtual events coming up. As I mentioned, we are closed right now due to COVID-19 restrictions, but we are planning, for example, next year we'll be having a major exhibit called Evicted that will look at the impact of eviction on marginalized communities. That's the, um, that's the, um, an exhibit we have coming up in 2021. We are the official sponsors at Jackson State for the Martin Luther King birthday convocation in 1969. Margaret Walker decided she wanted to celebrate Martin Luther King's birth rather than commemorate his death. So in January of 1969, she hosted our first Martin Luther King birthday convocation, and we've been doing that ever since. So we're in the process of planning 
uh, for that convocation. And right now, with everything that's going on, I don't think we're quite sure yet whether it's going to be an actual in-person event or if we're going to have to go virtual this year because, you know, everything is um, um, fluctuates based on how the um, virus is doing in the state. So, but those are the kinds of public programming we, we're planning as well. Wonderful. Uh, there is one. Dr. Oh, okay. Harrison, I think Dr. Harrison, she wants to. Yeah, I want to see that for uh, for project. We have a young kid but we are still, uh, we have two grants. Uh, with the grant from the And our long-term goal is to do the current grant. It is a real business. Uh, we are doing a lot of things. In fact, for tonight's forum, we have a person who is uh, walking to the who is going to be on talking about uh, her memories of Nick Griffin. And uh, according to our chronology, uh, as Angela started to say earlier, we are tracing the uh, midwives because they're the granny midwives. Most of the legislation and uh, information that's been written about African American midwives during a period of time from 1619 to about the 1980s uh, refer to them as the granny midwives. Uh, coming from the term that they used on the plantation, where uh, the granny midwives were the ones who not only delivered the baby for the slave community, but for the master's uh, family as well. Uh, and they were referred to as granny midwives. Well, after the Civil War, uh, the whole situation changed because they were no longer considered valuable for the uh, plantation. Uh, because of the Civil War. Uh, so they were on their own. Uh, and uh, as Andrew was pointing out, the, the government took over in 1921. And then with the changes that with uh, the uh, civil rights, the NAACP, uh, they were just as Primarily, uh, sort of dismissed, but they gave them a certificate of appreciation. Uh, but by 1980, there just were no more certificate issues. Um, but those are some of the, the final points of how uh, the granny midwives went out of existence. Is why uh, the Scott Ford project is on documenting those women because they have sort of been left out. Uh, all we learned is all cultures uh, have midwives. Many of the um, Chinese and other groups coming into America, they have their own midwives unless they are uh, wealthy enough to go to the hospitals. And that's a little fine point we're going to cover tonight. But thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to talk about the Stockholm project. The other project is the restoration of the midwife houses. I think we have the only house in Mississippi that's on the National Registry, the Mississippi landmark, where uh, the midwives the Dennis Scott Ford actually live and deliver babies in the house. Uh, so that's what uh, our project is about in terms of restoring the houses and interpreting. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, we do have one final question. And this question is, can you explain the importance of midwifery during the civil rights movement? During the civil rights movement? Yes. Um, 
the civil rights movement pushed the all the issues of injustices in the African American uh, front to the full front of uh, our concerns. And uh, when the, uh, they passed a law around 1947 about going to um, the hospital, African Americans in the South and Mississippi, if you were poor, you did not go to the hospital. But when it became uh, feasible that those hospitals had hit African Americans with whatever problems they had, and particularly with childbirth, uh, they did service African Americans, which caused fewer people going to the midwife. There's a lot of misinformation about what the midwives did, but it's often getting better help at the hospital. Um, one of the things I talk about from my family's perspective uh, is the condition where African Americans in the segregated hospital had to go. I had those first, I didn't have a baby there, but my mother did. I had an appendectomy in the Brennan Hospital, and we were all, I'm a young child. Anyway, so it's inadequate. You know, I was actually born in the segregated basement of the Baptist Hospital right here in Jackson. My mother talked about protesting her obstetrician who wanted her to wait in a segregated waiting room. And I'm not that old, but so, so this, these were things that people as part of the civil rights movement were looking at. Not only was civil rights about being able to attend integrated schools and um, integration of public accommodations, but it was about health care. Uh, our center director, Dr. Robert Smith, served on the medical committee for civil rights, and he protested out in front of the American Medical Association's annual meeting in Atlantic City. And he helped develop a series of community health centers in Mississippi that were looking at bringing health care, quality health care, back to communities so that marginalized people wouldn't be forced into situations where they would have to go to a segregated hospital or to a hospital that took less interest in their health care and didn't take their health problems as seriously. So that is how the civil rights movement and midwifery, because midwifery is a way of being able to take control of something that is very personal, and that's giving birth. And so midwives and doulas, um, especially today, allow for that opportunity to regain some control. And, and yes, so all of that could grow out of the civil rights movement. Thank you both so much. It's really interesting and all very good points. Um, but I don't think we have any other questions. So do you, do either of you have any closing thoughts that you'd want to share? Carrie, uh, I would like to share our website for a quick minute. If sure. you allow me to just. Okay, hang on one second. Okay. Feel free to share away. Thank. I think I think I'm still disabled from sharing though. Yeah. No one second. Should have it now. Thank you, Carrie. No problem.
Yeah, this is the Mara Walker website. And as I mentioned, you can follow us on various forms of social media. Also, when you come to our website, in this column, there is a link that allows you to sign up for our listserv, uh, our researcher application, our affiliations, such as the Association of African American Museums, the National Museums of African American History and Culture, and all those affiliations are listed here as well. Uh, uh, also, We have spent the last year collaborating with the university on the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Gibbs Green um, shootings here at Jackson State. So we also have a link available for that as well. Our um, website that allows you to access our um, collections is also available on here as well. Uh, so you would go from this uh, landing place to our um, digital archives project, which contains 50% of Margaret Walker's papers. We had under the direction of Dr. Albertine Harrison, a Ford Foundation and a National Endowment for the Humanities grant, grant which allowed us to digitize 50% of her papers. So I just wanted to allow you to see our webpage and what it looks like. Okay. <laughs> that um, one of the ways that you all list with the archives really helps to start forward with our project is if you start in your collection, you can have anything related to memory. Uh, we would be interested in that. Particularly if it's been graded by you. somebody has been made you some papers and you just happen to have some on another thing. Let us know about and that uh, sources for midwives. Because sorrows are increasingly entering the top and as far as I can see, the main place to go will be the dog will walk out and uh, because we don't intend to have that kind of capacity. We want to be a museum where we come and look at things and have fun. So we're glad for Margaret Walker. Thank you. Wonderful. So again, that was a uh kind of a plug if any Mississippi archivists around the state, if you know of any collections on midwifery. You know, give um, the Margaret Walker Center and the Scott Ford House Inc. a heads up and they can add it to their database. So that's good exposure for everyone. So definitely be on the lookout for those things. Great. Well, I'm going to share one slide real quick and wrap this thing up. So thank you everyone for joining us today at our second ever virtual table talk. Our next um, talk is tentatively set for November 20th on the Delta State Chinese Cultural Heritage Museum. And this talk will be given by Emily Jones. And there may be a few other guest speakers. We haven't confirmed those yet, um, but be on the lookout for that um, registration information. Um, you'll be able to find registration information through our social media channels as well as our listserv. Um, and I usually also post things to the SAA listserv 
That's a Society of American Archivists. So definitely be on the lookout for those things. We are also looking for more table talk speakers for our spring session. So if you're interested in being a presenter, um, please contact me. My name is Carrie Masley at cmasley at library.msstate.edu. Um, and you can learn more about the Society of Mississippi Archivists at our website, um, mississippiarchivist.org. Org. So thank you so much. We appreciate each and every single one of you for being here. And we are especially grateful to um, Angela and to Dr. Harrison for being here and talking about their project. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, email me and I'll make sure that um, Angela and Dr. Harrison gets those questions. Thank you. Thank you.